Hi everyone, I'm David Fisher, and this is Presidential Chronicles. The series of books and videos on American history is seen through the lives of the presidents of the United States. This episode is from the life of Rutherford Hayes, and the focus is the Ohio 23rd. The year is 1861. The Civil War has begun. President Abraham Lincoln has called for 75,000 volunteers to help suppress the Southern Rebellion. Rutherford Hayes, one of the many thousands who signed up. There were only 16,000 men in the U.S. Army at the time that the Civil War broke out. Most of them were out west fighting uh, Indian incursions in the areas of the frontier, and many of them went to the South. So there weren't very many professional soldiers who were staffing these armies for the, for the Civil War. Most were volunteers like Hayes, who had never fought before, but they believed in the cause and they signed up. And many formed militia units, just like Hayes's did in Ohio. Now he had some standing in the community, so he got an officer's position. He was named a major by the Governor William Dennison of the 23rd Ohio Voluntary Infantry. Now, a regiment had about a thousand soldiers in it, usually about eight to ten companies, 100 to 150 people each, and was led typically by a colonel, in this case a West Pointer by the name of William Rosecrans, was put in charge of the Ohio 23rd. You would then have a lieutenant colonel and a couple of majors, so Hayes was certainly part of that leadership group. And the bulk, of course, again, all volunteers, including an 18-year-old private who was part of the Ohio 23rd by the name of William McKinley. That's right, in the Ohio 23rd, you had two future presidents of the United States that would spend almost the entire four years of the war tied to the Ohio 23rd in one uh, respect or another. Now, Hayes had no military training. He learned a lot from Rosecrans, and he learned a lot from books. He was a quick study. He was reading, and then he was drilling his men occasionally or immediately thereafter. But he took to this role immediately. He sent Lucy a letter that said, I never enjoyed any business or mode of life as much as I do this. I really feel badly when I think of several of my intimate friends who are compelled to stay at home. I know we're in frequent perils, that we may never return at all that, but the feeling that I am where I ought to be is a full compensation for all that is sinister. He frankly never changed his mind on this. Four years at war were the best four years of his life. He was fighting for a cause, and the camaraderie with the men, there was really nothing like it. Hayes for these men was very much a natural leader. He needed their trust. These again weren't professional soldiers. If he wanted them to stay and fight with their lives on the line, potentially losing their lives in the process, you had to have that mutual bond and that bond of trust with your leader. And Hayes was very much that person. And he walked the walk of that role quite literally. A private once said that a braver or better man was not in the army. He, Hayes, had an abundance of grit. If he had a fault, it was that he was in battle. He was too eager. On a long, dusty march, I could always tell Colonel Hayes' horse, as it was always loaded with the guns and knapsacks of the boys who were giving out. The colonel himself walking by its side, no matter how great the heat. Again, he walked the walk, literally. He was always also out front. As the phrase went, Hayes would always shout, come on, boys, not Go on, boys, because he was always urging them on to join him in the, in the thick of the battle. He was really the perfect leader for the Ohio 23rd. Now, the Ohio 23rd was assigned duty in the western part of the state of Virginia. Now, the state of Virginia seceded from the Union, but the western part was actually an area of strong loyalty to the Union. And so the Ohio 23rd and other Union soldiers were sent in to protect the loyalists from Confederate Confederate incursions. The first real battle took place in September of 1861. This was the Battle of Carnifax Ferry, which was a win for the Union soldiers, and the Ohio 23rd had a relatively minor role, and that was actually typical in the first year of the war. They weren't involved with a lot of major fighting. There was a lot of fighting in the other parts of Virginia, certainly in Tennessee, in the western part of Virginia, not that much. It was pretty quiet. So, Hayes picked up some other duties. He was actually named for the brigade, the Judge Advocate General. He was involved in prosecuting a bunch of court martials, taking advantage of his legal uh, background and skills. That gave him a lot of time with the brigade leadership and perhaps helped him get his first promotion to a lieutenant colonel. That came through in October of 1861. After that, they went into winter quarters in Fayetteville and had a relatively quiet time during that winter period when Hayes heard from home that Lucy had given birth to their fourth son. They called him Joseph. Well, things were a little bit different in the spring of 1862. Rosecrans had been promoted, and now he had a new colonel in charge of the 23rd, Eli Kim Scammon, another West Pointer 
who took them deeper into Virginia now as their assignment. They were going to take on the Confederates near Giles Courthouse, and this was going to be a tough fight because they were outnumbered, about two to one. Hayes, in this initial battle, held his line initially, but they were overwhelmed, and he was sent running, in fact, running quite some time before they were able to actually get to their own defensive lines. And this was the first time that Hayes was wounded in battle. He took some shrapnel just below the right knee. It was, it was kind of a minor injury, but of his four wounds that he would sustain during the Civil War, it was actually the one that would cause him the most discomfort later in life. Hayes was being recognized as being this leader of men, and he was offered a promotion, another one, to a full colonel. He was going to get his own regiment, the 79th Ohio, and he turned it down. He'd rather stick as a lieutenant colonel with his own men, his volunteers. That bond was more important than moving up the hierarchy within the army. So he said, no, I'm going to stay a lieutenant colonel. I'll stay with the 23rd. The most significant fighting in the war for the 23rd was just about to come. Union General John Pope's boys had just been trounced in the Second Battle of Bull Run. The 23rd of Ohio was sent to help out. The first fight heading, really the first major fight going into northern soil was up ahead. Confederate General Robert E. Lee decided to take advantage of his victory at Bull Run and move into northern soil, crossing the Potomac River with 55,000 Confederate soldiers into northwestern Maryland. They made their base near Frederick. Lincoln decided to replace General Pope, bring back General George McClellan to be put in charge of around the 90,000 men who were operating in the Union Army in and around Washington, D.C., and they were heading off to meet Lee in northern Maryland. A major engagement was clearly in the offing. Lee decided to make his stand at Antietam Creek near Sharpsburg, Maryland, but he needed more time to set up his defenses, so he sent a bunch of men into South Mountain. Now, this is what the Blue Ridge Mountains were called on the Maryland side of the border, and they had to defend three passageways through South Mountain, Crampton's Gap, Turner's Gap, and Fox's Gap. And it was at Fox's Gap that Hayes and the Ohio 23rd were sent, literally the pointy end of the spear. And the clash took place on September the 14th. Hayes and his men were ordered to capture a couple of Confederate guns. And he said to his men, now boys remember you are the 23rd and give them hell. And he sent that first wave in and it was repulsed by the Confederates. The second wave went in, they started to gain some traction. So just as Hayes ordered the third charge, he felt a stunning blow. A musket ball had hit his left arm just above the elbow, fractured the bone. It actually left his ribs fractured and blood was gushing out of this wound. He feared that an artery might have been breached, might have been cut, so he had a man tie a handkerchief around the wound, just above the wound. He's still trying to bark orders to his men, but the, frankly, he was getting weaker, in and out of consciousness. He ordered his men to fall back to the safety behind the tree line, but that actually left him completely exposed on the field of battle between these two armies. And again, falling in and out of consciousness, he didn't know he was going to make it but he still was friendly Rutherford Hayes. There was a Confederate soldier that was similarly wounded by him, and he actually struck up a friendly conversation with the rebel soldier, and they were having this conversation while Hayes didn't know if he was even gonna make it. Hayes decided to write out a final note to Lucy in case he would die there on the battlefield. What did he do with that note? He gave it to the Confederate, asking him to deliver it just in case. Well, at this point, he finally called out for some help, and he said to his team, hello, 23rd men, are you going to leave your colonel here for the enemy? Well, of course, they responded immediately, at which point the Confederates responded with a response fire, and they had to get back behind the trees. But the savior for Hayes was a lieutenant by the name of B.W. Jackson, who made his way, pulled Hayes from the field of exposure behind the trees, got him to a field hospital where his wound was dressed, he was able to walk about a mile and a half before he was finally taken by an ambulance to Middletown where he could finally start to rest and recover. Well, this was a costly fight for the Ohio 23rd. 130 wounded, 32 killed more than any other unit, but this was still nothing compared to what was about to happen. While Hayes was recuper recuperating, three days later, the clash at Antietam, the single bloodiest day of the war, but Hayes would not be there to participate. Now, as for Lucy Hayes, she heard that her husband had been wounded and she was panicked. She went to the field. She was traveling around to find him. She actually made her way to Washington, D.C. before she was rerouted back to Middletown. She finally reunited with her husband. He got leave. She took him home for a couple of months of recovery. Well, during that time, he was promoted. Full colonel, 
When he came back from his wounds, he would be in charge of the Ohio 23rd. The nature of the war changed at this point as well, because after the Battle of Antietam, President Lincoln issued his draft emancipation proclamation, which said that any, any areas of the country, states or regions were, were, that were still in rebellion against the United States on January 1st, 1863, about 100 days away, their slaves would all be freed out of a military necessity per the commander in chief. Rutherford Hayes was completely aligned with this. He and Lucy both aligned with the fact that this was no longer just a fight about preserving the Union. If they didn't want to have to go through this again, they had to end slavery. And so Hayes said at the time, the man who thinks that the perpetuity of slavery is essential to the existence of the Union is unfit to be trusted. The deadliest enemy the Union has is slavery. In fact, its only enemy. The fight was now to save the Union and free the slaves, and Rutherford Hayes was ready to get back into that fight. But that's the story for another day. That's Rutherford Hayes and the Ohio 23rd from the life of Rutherford Hayes. For more Presidential Chronicles, check out my books on Amazon.com. And don't forget to subscribe to my YouTube channel. Until next time, I'm David Fisher. This is Presidential Chronicles.